From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, that winning window happens early for most coaches. How long will it last for Mike Norvell? And another sweep of epic historical proportions for Florida State baseball. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, cptallybar.com, the website. Daily lunch specials, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. today. Half pound all black Angus beef burger with a side dish of your choice. Again, only eight ninety nine. Good to see a lot of people out there on Friday too, following the War Chant Jeff Cameron charity golf tournament. I bowed out after about an hour and a half, two hours. You hold it down into the uh, twilight hours uh, for the for the brand, Corey Clark. Uh, no, I left around uh, four. Uh, the wife, the wife needed a nap. We all uh, needed a so nap. We did. Yeah, Some I more than just, others, but yes, I yes. Uh, her, but I took a nap too. Uh, hers was longer and more needed, uh, but then went back up to corner pocket around 9 or 10. Can't get enough, everybody. Corey Clark, look at enough. that. Two in one day. That's how he rolls. Warchant.com, the ultimate symbol sports source. Thumbs up, five-star ring and review. Subscribe. FSU1 for the folks listening on YouTube or this podcast in general. Two months of access, only one American dollar. How about that? Spring game this weekend is going to be awesome. I don't know if, if we're doing are we doing any sort of meet and greet. Should find out about that, hopefully. Should have known about that to promote if we're doing it or not. But uh, how excited are you for this upcoming weekend, Corey? And how was your weekend? It was good, man. Uh, started with the golf. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Ira in his element uh, was a lot of fun to see. Uh, he, had, he had a good time. Everybody's a little loosey-goosey out there. It was fun. Um, 8 a.m. isn't great. Tea time. Yeah. I'd like to push that back a little bit, but I get same, it. Golf's same. a different. Golf's a different sport. Got to start early. Um, but, yeah, did uh, did the golf. Then w- uh, went to baseball on Thursday night. Went to baseball on uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, all in all, real good time, buddy. Okay. Good weekend. Good. Um, you kind of want to, you know, I feel like you should almost start with baseball uh, due to the magnitude of it. But I know it pays the bills. It's still spring football season. We get two practices to watch this week on Tuesday and Thursday, followed by the spring showcase Saturday, Dope Campbell Stadium, 4 p.m., and then they'll have their 15th and final practice on Sunday, which will be closed to us. Or maybe it's on Monday. I'm not sure. But I know the, the, the 14th practice of the 15th is the penultimate spring showcase on Saturday. And then the one after that, we won't be able to watch. Um, you know, just a couple thoughts percolating in my head, Corey, being out at the golf tournament, talking to some people out there, listening to my other podcasts uh, out there. And how much do you still think about the whole – factor of of coaches that have had success winning national titles it kind of happens in the the very early part of their careers in modern history it seems like at at the uh, establishments they've been at the institutions they're at I I asked this because I was listening to a podcast talking about Calipari leaving for Arkansas and I think Cal won his one and only national championship in the third season he was out there and we know about Jimbo and Urban Meyer and, and yeah. Les Miles and Ed Orgeron and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they also mentioned, like, I, th- I think they said Cal had only been to one Sweet 16 in the last six years. So Larry yeah. Hamilton's been to more Sweet 16s than John Calipari in the last six years. So I'll put that in your pipe. How, how much thought do you give that at all to the window, if there is one, for Mike Norvell? Or does this just feel so stable that this is only the beginning of what – seems to be a dynasty again. It's a weird stat because I get what you're saying. Number one, there just aren't many coaches around that have that have won national championships. I guess Dabo, Dabo was yeah. around for a decade before he won one, right? Yeah, Somewhere, he's an outlier, something like that. For sure, yeah. um, but there aren't that many active ones that have done it. Uh, and so I guess the stat implies that if you're not going to win a championship in year three or four, you're not going to win one. But Nick Saban won one in year 12. And then in year 14, in the year six, well, you know what I mean? Like year 11. Uh, Kirby was, what, four, five years in? Four years in? I think it was five or five or six. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, But look, he got to I, a I, national title game in year three or well, two. I mean, if, you know. let's, if, 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 we, if we treat the COVID year for what it was, which it was a weird year, uh, clearly a weird, bizarre year, um, and say that counted as half a year. Well, Mike Norvell got his team into the playoff in year three and a half. 
you know, it, they didn't get to go. They weren't invited. We all know. Don't have to rehash that. Worthy but, of it, though. Uh, they cr- but created a team that's worthy of it. Yeah. But they were undefeated. Yeah. Uh, it beat LSU. Beat the Heisman winner by a lot, uh, but didn't get to go. Uh, so he, he's. I think he's right on the trajectory that all the all the great coaches have have shown. I think um, it didn't work out, but you know, I know his great team. The great team he's had so far was 2023. It was not Jimbo's great team of 2013, but they both accomplished the same thing. They both went 13 and 0. So you know he did it a little differently. The sport is a little different. Uh, the sport's a lot different, not a little different. It's a lot different. Um, but you know, 13 and 0 is 13 and 0, and um, that's what I kind of hold on to. Is I don't, I again, I just don't think it's a blip. I don't think it's an anomaly. I I don't know that. I don't expect them to go 13 and 0 every year. Clearly, obviously. I do expect them, with him at the helm, as long as they don't have horrible, horrible injury luck, to be in the playoff race every year. Hmm. That's kind of all you can hope for, right? Yeah, it's dynasty Right, and, and, and I know that you know in the dynasty you had to be in the top two to get a chance to play for the title. Well, now you got to be in the top 12. So if you're in that area um, and you, can keep, you keep giving yourself a chance to get into the playoff and then get hot, well, then maybe a championship or two will come. It has never been harder to win a national championship moving forward than it is from here on out. Right? Yes. Well, that segues, dovetails into like the second point about being out at that golf tournament and talking to people that are, you know, more educated and much more curious about the, the NIL space. And we all know just how vital that's been to this entire turnaround. And we don't know how long it's going to last. And I'd, I'd rather see it end sooner than later uh, in terms of just being able to leverage outside dollars to to fund your football program. Look, it's been great for this program. It's been great for my career covering this team. Uh, But I would like to see it kind of end so that everybody's kind of operating in a similar sort of deck. How how vital is it to to really take advantage in these next like two or three years? And then sub question of that is like, would they take like, you know, I wonder if Mike Norville would have been okay in in an era that didn't have NIL with a 12-team playoff of like rolling out with a guy like Brock Glenn, or, or do you think there's like that urgency with this window existing to to go out there and get somebody like a DJ that you think might be able to elevate your your chances? Just how important are these next, I think, I don't know, two, three years? That might be kind of a, a, a fair guess, Corey, for how long we have the same system in place, at least when it comes to NIL being used for other things and just name, image, and likeness. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I quite understand the question, but I think my answer to it is because I'll answer something as on even if I don't completely understand the question. That's how that's how the doctor rolls. Um, but I, I think that he has got the program now to a point where he will be just fine when NIL is dialed back. Okay, that, that's, the, it that's is regulated. Kind of, yeah. I don't know that he could have gotten it there to this point without it, though. Yeah. You know, I just it was so it was such a dumpster fire, and there have been a lot of great coaches that just could not overcome what was left for them. And they end up being great somewhere else, and, and they just get unfairly judged by what they had to take over, and they can't get it back on the track, on the right track. NIL and the portal expedited his rebuild process very, very, very quickly. I don't know that he could. He, I do know he couldn't have done it that quickly without it. And then maybe people get really frustrated in his third or fourth year, and they move on to something else. Uh, I do think he would have built it up to where it was uh, decent again. But he, it, there's no chance 13 and 0 comes without NIL or Portal. Just look at the names, folks. Yeah. I'm not saying anything crazy there. But now that it's where it is, now that he's got it where it is, and you see how they're recruiting, and all the guys they have, like real legitimate, like high school recruits. I think the way he coaches, he's a name, man. He is one of the most well-known coaches in the United States now. That was not the case four years ago. He's like, where is he from? He he did what at Memphis? Oh, all right. They went to the Cotton Bowl. Okay, I guess that's cool. Uh, he took over for who? Fuente. All right. Uh, so I now he is one of the I don't know, man, ten most recognizable head coaches in the country. At an at, at what I'd like to call an iconic brand mm. of a program. So I think now he's he's built the foundation. He's got the personality. He's got I don't even know if personality is the right word. The persona. He's known that I think Florida State and Norvell will, will start almost recruiting themselves again. If if I'm saying the NIL 
gets regulated to where it isn't pay for play, and it is just guys that have already been on campus and letting make make name, image, and likeness. But who knows if and when that'll ever happen? I like Lane Kiffin, obviously, but I recognize that he's recruited the way he's recruited at Ole Miss because of NIL. I realize that Ole Miss was reached the heights they did under Hugh Freeze because he bent rules and, and did NIL before. He paper snapped play. them in half. Yeah, before it was even bend them. a real thing. And I just wonder, and I, I tend to agree with you, I, I do think even when this is all regulated, he'll still be able to recruit at a pretty high level. But again, like I, the, the, the because I of what he's done these last four or five years, right? The proof is there now. It wasn't three or four years ago. Yeah, especially maybe like in a month from now when all these right. guys are yep. in the NFL and then you can kind of, yep. because listen, I mean, that's, you know, you can say that Nick Saban is being disingenuous or not, but I really think, and you know, that's what Cal used a lot too, right? I was just like, listen, like you're going to come to Kentucky. I'm going to put you in the league. Um, and I'm not going to stand in your way of, of making yeah. as much money as you possibly can for your family. You know, Saban, I think was obviously like, come to my program, make me great. Let me win a bunch of games, but I'm also going to get you ready for the next level. And there were still other things going along, you know, the recruitment process five, 10, 15 years ago, but it wasn't nearly as pronounced as it ha- as it's been the last three years. I just wonder if that's like a weight on people in this program. Like, well, let's we don't know what it's going to look like in three years. We don't know where we're going to be. So we really need to take advantage of this of this window that we have now because it, it might not be as great as it is right now. I but I don't think that's that that's me just trying to be contrary and have some conversation on a well. On a slow my Monday. my bigger concern as somebody that wants Florida State to always be be good in football is. Um, you know, these other programs will catch up. Florida State, for whatever reason, because they're smart, because of the battle's end, um, who are smart people, they were the first ones out of the gate. They were the first ones out of the out of the starters blocks, It seemingly. They played the NIL game as well or better than everyone in the country. And other schools now, with more resources, are as much resources, but more, understand now, oh, this is what we have to do. So... The prices could just keep getting more and more exorbitant. And that's what I wonder, can you compete long term? I'm more worried about the NIL staying around than I am it going away and can Norvell compete on an even playing field if NIL is is regulated. Mm. I'm more worried about it if it isn't regulated in all these other big boy schools uh, are like, oh, you're the number one wide receiver in the country? Well, we we will make it where you can't say no to us. And that's what you're competing with now. Because uh, Florida Florida State just does not have some of that money. They have a lot, clearly. Good football teams here the last few years. But maybe when these other schools start taking it as seriously as Florida State did, um, you know, th- that's where it could get a little dicey. Yeah. Florida State did practice on Friday. We were not out there. Uh, but a lot of you were at the baseball game. You might have seen a scene out front, the baseball and the football practice facility where uh, the school – made an announcement about a, a student athlete, a football player, uh, due to an abundance of caution being ambulanced out of practice on Friday evening. Uh, feels like there was a, I don't know, happy ending to it all. Uh, yeah. They they were released soon thereafter, so that's obviously a good thing. We're not going to disclose the name of the player because we're not allowed to do that kind of stuff. Um, and we're not going to give any hints or anything, but just it, it's okay, everybody. Like, that guy's okay. Everything's going to be yeah, okay. Yeah, like Friday evening, uh, maybe in the hospital for, I would guess, just doing the timeline in my head, probably in the hospital for four hours, just getting looked at, precautionary measures, then released. So that's, you know, that's very good news because when you're, look, man, it's a dangerous game they're playing. When you're ambulanced out, and the reason it even, I think the reason they even announced it at all, because it was closed, practice was closed on Friday, uh, because baseball was going on. So there were people that saw it. There were people that saw an ambulance. Uh, they turned around and saw it on the practice field because they butt up against each other. Um, so that's why I think why Florida State made sure to release it to make sure that people knew. Uh, and I think some recruits were there and might have tweeted stuff out mm-hmm. on social media about what happened because there were hundreds of recruits there. Um, so you can't control all that. But, yeah, it sounds like it was a uh, uh, it, it was very per- precautionary in nature and that uh, nothing maybe – nothing long-term um, – what what happened? Where where you know you guys know what we're talking about. When we're talking about ambulance to hospitals, but again, it was just, it seemed like it was just an abundance of caution. The young man was released, um, yeah, later that night. And it was orthopedic, they said, so it wasn't you know wasn't any kind of cardiac event or anything like that. Right, so, right. Um, just to add uh, that's good. Yeah, very good. It. Putting that. Yes, thank you for um, saying that. 
All right, so Corey, we, we get to watch two more practices, then we're all going to watch Saturday together as a big happy family. And I know you're the voice of reason on the podcast and, and most podcast spaces when it comes to Florida State sports. Mm. Uh, is it possible for you to see stuff, quote unquote stuff, out of DJ Uwe Ungalale tomorrow, Thursday, and then all of us on Saturday that will enhance your confidence level of where this team can ultimately end up uh, after the season's over? I guess. I guess. Uh, I, I, I kind of just feel like I know what he is, mm. but that's probably not fair to him. Uh, we, we're all improving or trying to in our lives. Uh, he improved a lot from 22 to 23. So if he can make another similar jump in 23 to 24, albeit in a different offense, um, then he could be really good. I just expect him to be pretty good, which is, you know, kind of the way I look at this roster right now is all they need. But, I guess, man, if he goes out there and looks uh, really good on uh, on on Saturday, his first time wearing that in front of thousands of fans, and, and it's not his first time in Doak. He had one of his best ever games in Doak. Uh, if he looks like that kid that we saw in 22 uh, with that Clemson team, then, yeah, I guess I would be like, okay, all right, TJ, maybe I should raise the expectations of what you can be. It's just that even if he looks awesome, the season's still four months away. It, so if they were playing Georgia Tech the following, like two Saturdays from now, and I saw that, I'd be like, oh, yeah, it's good. But I, I just – I don't know that I'll, I'll – uh, it's not like the Jameis where you're like, you have no, we didn't see him at all. We hadn't seen him throw a single pass because practices were closed. And then we saw that revelation in the spring game after hearing all the whispers and rumors about how good he was. And you're like, oh, man, okay, never mind. They He might be unbelievable. I don't think we're going to leave Saturday thinking – DJ is going to be unbelievable. But I I think we're going to leave there thinking, yep, looks pretty good to me. Is it not about him then? I, I it's just it's quarterback, so it's the most important position. Is is there something else? Is it something is it a position around him? Is it the other side of the ball you think that would help answer the the more pressing question for you or help, you know, move the needle when it comes to your optimism? And you do No, and I and I, I think I'm kind of uh I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer when it comes to spring games. I just I don't know how much we get out of them, um, more than what we've seen in practice. Like I feel like I've kind of made my decisions. Now this isn't fair to the people listening to this because y'all haven't gotten to watch practice. So spring game will be the first time you got to, you guys you guys get to make opinions and see for yourself what we've been talking about. But you know if if Jalen Lucas doesn't do much on Saturday or only has six touches for 21 yards, I'm not going to then think oh, I was I was wrong about all those other 10 practices I saw. Like, you know, it's just – it's one finite little area of football, space of football. It's not a real game. So I'm not trying to poo-poo it, but I don't know that I'll take any – just the one game will give me anything where I think I'm, I feel much better or worse about things than I do right now. You know, I don't know if that made any sense at all, but I just – I don't know. I'd love to see the receivers go and make contested catches. Okay. That's what I'd like. The thing I'm still – the thing I've been looking for all spring, I will still be looking for. Who plays well with the lights on? Well, I guess the, it's a, what does that game start? 4 p.m. Uh, the lights might be on just to yeah. do it. They might have the LEDs out there, just show them off. Um, but, yeah, I want to see who does well with people. I, I do want to see if any of the young guys or new guys step up in the moment and have big-time afternoons. That would be a good sign, I guess. And to that end, if DJ does that, if DJ looks better than he's looked all spring, and he look, he's looked good, fine all spring, if he has a great day, well, maybe that does say something about him. It's just that I remember Mackenzie Milton having a pretty darn good spring game after not looking, after legitimately looking like a walk-on during practice that we got to watch that spring. He then went into this spring game, and it's like, oh, man, he looks like the kid at UCF again. Yeah. And it turns out he was more like the guy we saw all spring and not just that one-and-a-half-hour window. It is going to be tricky because I don't know how that offen- how similar the offensive line that's in front of him on Saturday is going to be to the right. unit that will be pre- protecting him in Dublin in- on August 24th. So that's that's going to be kind of a tricky thing to maybe factor in. But yeah, I mean, as long as it as long as I see like confidence in terms of knowing where to go with the ball, not a lot of hesitancy. That's like the biggest thing it's going to be for me to to feel good about where they're at. Because again, I know it's whatever four months away, but. You know, I mean, he doesn't, you know, this is, he's got one shot. I mean, he only has four months to get ready. He doesn't have two years and four months or right. a year and four months. So, uh, and he's been brought here for the specific reason to be a stop gap or 
maybe just maintain the level of excellence they had last year. So he's been good though. The yeah, last, yeah. He, especially the last week, I thought he was. Uh, we talked about he and Brock Glenn. There wasn't a lot. If you didn't know who the other person was, who was the senior, who was the freshman, you couldn't really tell who was predicted to be the first string, who was predicted to be the second string. They were all. They were both pretty close. I thought the last week he was clearly the better quarterback. Um, and then apparently that was coming off a scrimmage that he looked great. So if he can then build on that with another solid week this week and then look good again in the spring game, well, then, yeah, I guess I'm going back on what I said. I would start to think, okay, he might he might be an all-ACC candidate this year. If, and if you can get all-ACC play out of your quarterback, you're going to have a good offense. Which is what which you Which means last you're year. going to have a good football team. Yep, yep. Shout out to our guy in Old Dad 84 following up on his journey with Vitamin Energy. Tweeted at us the other day, no lie, this stuff is fantastic. I have a six-year-old and I work two jobs. I have to get up at five in order to get a workout in. I'm usually exhausted by 2 p.m. I took a half shot the, uh, today. Not today, today, but obviously like last week when he did this, his testimonial. I took a half shot and I feel great. I even skipped any soda and drank water all day. Okay. And, and as Corey can attest to, when you start drinking water all day, everything in life gets better. Mm-hmm. Amen. So go to vitaminenergy.com, use the promo code WARCHAMPBOGO, WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. Hopefully Noel Dad 84 ordered like three and then got three for free. Uh, and if not, it's still a good value, even if you don't have the BOGO code. But the BOGO code helps. So give it a shot if you haven't done so already, everybody. Go to vitaminenergy.com. Noel's behind this thing, getting it all rocking and rolling for us. Promo code WARCHAMPBOGO, WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. Energy with benefits, vitaminenergy.com. The baseball, Corey. Huge weekend for the Knolls on the diamond. Yeah. Uh, ladies swept Notre Dame? Well, we're going to go ahead and assume they did. Oh, they're, the they're Sunday playing after we later. record, but yes, let's go ahead and assume they did. And if they didn't, that's Aslan's fault, everyone. Uh, Reverse jinxed it. Just, they won the series, though. Yeah, still, still doing well in the ACC, so mm -hmm. yep. whatever that's worth. Um, awesome. Baseball, meanwhile... Very emotional week, right? Like Florida on Tuesday, and then you have a three-game series that starts on a Thursday. Uh, we obviously talked about the victory on Thursday night in our much-acclaimed podcast uh, done right outside uh, Hauser on a bench. Friday With all and the distractions. Yeah, yeah. Friday and Saturday. Apparently, Matt, uh, our guy Matt Lasser, his girlfriend walked past us while we were recording, he said. Oh, maybe, all right. Maybe there's a group that try to like photo bomb or, or podcast bomb us. Maybe she was the one that like pulled them away. I remember that almost happened. Um, somebody was a little tipsy and they were like trying to lean in and, and say something, and their friend was like, "Stop doing that." Mm, so nice. shout out to whoever thank that you, friend. Was. Thank yeah. you, friend. Nonetheless, Florida State uh, won the game on Thursday night and then followed up with victories on Friday and Saturday, which I think is called a sweep, Corey. Mm, it is. That's a new term. And if the annals of time are correct as well, this the first time since 1960 yep. that Florida State went undefeated against Florida and Miami in a season. They swept both teams in the same single season. So, I mean, that, that says it all. Um, but can you say anything else, Corey, our wordsmith, about uh, what this weekend was and what this baseball team is? Uh, I mean, it's no, but I, well, yes, of course. If I just said no, and that was the end of the Thanks podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Check everybody. See podcast. you tomorrow. <laughs> so, yes, I can say more. Um, yeah, I just think, man, it, it and look, I, I understand, number one, the next two series, they're on the road. They're at Wake and at Duke. So, that's, that's tough. That's tough sledding. Uh, hope to just break even, honestly, on the road. Uh, but, hey, there's no reason to put a ceiling on this team. Uh, the way the way they've been playing so far, but either way, uh, tough tough road games coming up. They won't have road at they won't have home atmospheres like this again. Probably, maybe supers if they're hosting if they're hosting in a super, maybe a regional, a regional championship. A reg yeah, maybe. Um, but I mean, it's just Florida and Miami also bring out more than like a Friday night against UAB or a Saturday against Ole Miss or whoever you'd be playing. You know what I mean? It just does. Set an attendance more, record too, by the way. They did for the not uh, well probably for the week but also just for the weekend uh, against Miami. And this wasn't even a good Miami team. It was, I mean, And it was a six, Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. Uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And that's what's so cool, man, is, is you know, I, I got here, started covering. I, didn't, I never really came to – I didn't. I didn't come to any Florida State baseball games in Tallahassee my whole life. Just that wasn't something me and my dad drove down for. We just would drive down for uh, football games. So my first experience really in Hauser was the Buster year. 
Um, well, you had three, but you guys know which one I mean. Oh eight. That those crowds were awesome, but it, I just I wasn't there. Maybe I wasn't covering it as much, but I don't remember going to a lot of night games that were just out of control that year. And it's also like the excitement about that team didn't seem like it really amped up until near the postseason, especially when they lost to flipping Bucknell <laughs> in the opener fight. It shut out, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then went on that epic run where Buster seemed to hit a home run every at bat, and that was an incredible offense. So, um, and then they beat Wichita State in the Supers. Those crowds were great, but it was so hot, Aslan. <laughs> it was so hot. Uh, and, and since then, though, look, Hauser's been nice. They've had really good moments. They've gone to Omaha a few times. Uh, they've clinched in, in Hauser a couple of times to, to go to Omaha. So it's not like there haven't been great moments. But I just, since I've been covering them, I mean, but I, I felt it just felt different this weekend, man. It just like we're, we're still in April. In my, this is not a number one in the country Miami team. This was a team that was 16 and 16 coming in. Florida's barely 500 on Tuesday. And these crowds were epic. And I just think it's really cool what that Florida State baseball is back in that regard. Because for too long, I, we've been lamenting what it looks like at those SEC stadiums. Mm-hmm. Now, they're bigger, and they're, you know, they're bigger, and they're nicer, and they're, they're more recent. But that doesn't mean they have to be louder and better. And you can't, if you were in any of the games this weekend, you can't argue that that wasn't a great crowd. Not, not like a long, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm not talking about quantity. I'm talking about quality. It was a great baseball crowd. And that was just really cool to see again at Hauser. And that goes to what Link has built with this team. And it goes to what these players have done and the way they play. They're, they're just fun to watch. Uh, it's not a strikeout fest. Uh, they make plays in the field. They run the base as well. Um, they, they're tough. They talk some smack. Uh, uh, especially my man Marco um, getting Miami all riled up. Uh, but it's just it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch how they uh, enjoy competing. And I think it's not just that they're really good. They're now 30 and 5. It's the way they play that it just feels like, man, it's what I, re- it's what I always heard Hauser was like back in the day. That's what it felt like again this weekend. 5-4 went on Thursday, 11-7 to went on Friday, 6-4 to went on Saturday. And that Saturday game was back and forth in all yeah. sorts of high-pressure, high-leverage moments. Who were like the three stars from the weekend? I, Brennan Oxford's one, right? Or at so, least one of them. Yes, I would say, um, yeah, for sure what he did on Friday in game two. Um, you know, Cam Smith had a great series. Um, hit just He hit a home run on... He had a double off the screen that he pimped because he thought it was out, but it was too high or too low. He still got to second. He, he raced for a double anyway. Um, and then hit a, hit a one over the fence his next at bat and then hit one 113 miles an hour the, at bat after that that was just caught in left center field. He hit the ball really hard all weekend. That's good to see. I would say him, um, Jamie Arnold, and probably Brennan Oxford. Right. Arnold being able to go seven innings, knowing that you don't have two other starters, is a really big deal. Then you got to save your bullpen a little bit, uh, and 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 because you needed them the next two days, like you didn't get a great start. Uh, who's pitched on Saturday? Lauk. I don't even remember? Or, no, 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 no. Dorsey Lauk. started no, Dorsey on Saturday, started, yeah. and who pitched on Friday? Lauk. Yeah, Lauk. Yeah. Yeah. Neither one of them made it through the fourth inning. I don't think so. You needed a lot of bullpen work, and look, man, I think they have a decent, it's a pretty good bullpen. The problem is they they. All, none of them are like absolutely 100% reliable, lights out, but they all have that in them. Mm-hmm. Like Andrew Armstrong was uh, not good at all the last time he pitched. Yeah, on Thursday he, was not good. No. Then he came in on uh, on Saturday and pitched four and two-thirds. One third. Uh, it, four and one. Sorry. Hey, come on, Aslan. Let me just talk. That's good. That's good. I'm just saying. I, I don't have much to add. I just want to have this, the, the stats correct. Right. Well. Gotcha. Sorry. So him pitching, getting 13 outs when you don't know how you're going to get those final, you know, 15 outs was really big. Now, he gave up some really hard-hit contact, but they made the plays. He kept them in the park. Uh, just, yeah, man, I would say Arnold, probably Arnold Oxford, maybe even Armstrong, maybe all three of those guys were reason. That's pretty cool, too, right? Each game, you had a dude step up. Now, Arnold is obviously understandable. You expect him to be really good. Oxford has been good. But, I mean, that was probably the biggest moment of the year for him, I think. Well, to be extended uh, to, that far out, we yes. haven't seen that out of him. So to so to have a guy do that one day and then have Armstrong be extended the next day and do a similar thing, uh, good to see, man. 
good to see and, and, and good to know you have it because you still don't know when you're getting uh, Cam Leiter back. You hope it's soon, yeah. and you're hoping you get Ben Barrett back, and then all of a sudden you're kind of looking at a, a, a pitching staff that, you know, even if Whitaker isn't ever back, um, looks pretty darn good to go along with a, a good defense and a great offense. Yeah, the Connor Whitaker thing, if it ends up not being a, you know, a season returning window, that that's a big bummer, though. Um, it is, and you know the reason we say that is because Link said earlier in the week, like we don't know wh- if or when he'll be back. That he didn't rebound well. They were very worried about it. Didn't get any updates. Um, but yeah, that was uh, so we don't know when he'll be back. It doesn't sound like it'll be anytime soon, which is which is a bummer. But Lighter is supposed to be back soon. Yeah. Um, maybe for Wake. Uh, maybe the next weekend. You don't know. But uh, yeah, I just that it, it's cool because. There's so many different contributors. They all had their moments. Yeah. Every every single person that played, including Fisher, who uh, I don't think he got a hit. He started on Saturday, didn't get a hit, but made probably the play of the game to start that double play that was 100 miles an hour off the bat that he backhanded almost on a short hop and then started a double play with Lodis that got them out of the uh, fifth inning, sixth inning, whatever inning it was. Yeah, yeah back to your point about this. And we've talked about it, you know, for like two, three weeks now, it feels like where the bullpen, it's just, it's so weird to find like the right adjective to describe them because it's not a horror show, but it's not Mariano Rivera running out of the the gate either. Like a guy like Joe Charles on Thursday absolutely saves the night for you and and gets you like the last six outs. But then I think on Friday, he struggled a little bit, got touched up in, in his yeah. inning and third of work. Same thing with Andrew Armstrong, like we said, Thursday. I, I don't – six pitches and links like it's over with. But maybe that's – the the part of it is like maybe you and I can't figure out who's the right hot hand because there was even a moment there on what? I think on Saturday when Link went against like doing a righty-righty matchup and brought a lefty in to, to finish it up or maybe vice versa. Maybe I'm getting it transposed there. But he at least, the guy that needs to know – seemingly is playing is figuring out this is not working like we'll, we'll we'll try him okay i've seen enough let's bring in the other guy and thus far it's worked out in florida state's favor almost every single time it feels like yeah um which is good man it's good to have i'm not going to call it luck uh, I'll, I'll give you an example so back to the armstrong he brought him in to face that their really good first baseman who ended up getting ejected later in the game we got to talk about that in a second um <laughs> But he brought Armstrong in, who's a lefty, to pitch to the righty. Well, after the game, he was talking about some of the Miami guys have reverse splits, meaning they hit better against righties than they do lefties. Um, so a right-hander who has a reverse split might hit 380 against righties and only 210 against lefties. So he was playing the odds and brought in a lefty, and he got a double play. Now, again, the ball was hit 100, literally 100 miles an hour, but he got a double play out of him. So that worked. You could call that lucky, good coaching, whatever. But then earlier in the game, uh, who was it? Lodis leads off with a double. He asked Max Williams, who's got more power probably than anyone on the team, to bunt twice. Max Williams doesn't get the bunt down either time. First one, he dribbles off the plate. The second one, he kind of misses completely. The next pitch, he hits off the screen for a double. And it's like, well, that's just good luck. <laughs> like, if he would have done what you wanted him to do, it would have been a runner at third with one out. Instead... There's a runner at second, nobody out, and a run's already scored, and then Cam Smith hits a home run on the next pitch. So sometimes things work out well, uh, which is good, man. I feel like, look, Florida State has won a, a, probably more baseball games than anyone over the last 40 years, certainly the top five in the country. But it has felt they've been snake bitten a few times. Maybe they just got a really lucky dude as the head coach now. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> just get a guy that's got a horseshoe up his head. That would be great for everybody. They they need a they need some good luck with the post with the baseball gods uh, every now and again. Yeah, because the football coach didn't have it for a long time, right? We thought he was snake bit for a while. Yeah, then it turns out if you just keep recruiting really good players and giving yourself a chance, it doesn't. You're, you're not snake bitten. You'll you're going to win some games. Bobby Cox even won a World Series. Yeah. All right. So, what happened Saturday, Corey? Um, Marco Dinges hurting people's feelings helping add some uh, much-needed insurance and then um, just sending the entire Miami. I think everybody in the Miami infield wanted a piece of Dinges yeah. after his solo trot. So I, I'm in the press box, and I always watch him because I, I had texted you earlier in the day, you and Ira, that he stared down the pitcher after a walk. Mm-hmm. 
Like, he's one of those guys where when he walks, Dinges I'm talking about, he's a big kid. Like, he's not Cam Smith big, but he's put together. He's jacked. He's curling. What do we think he's curling, Aslan? 100? Like on, the 100 easy, one, on the easy curl bar or the straight 45 dumbbell or barbell? The barbell. Just yeah. both arms going. Yeah, 25. He's got 95 on the bar easy, just repping. repping yeah, but, so repping. he could probably do 120, I bet, just curling. He's, yeah. he's got guns for days. Big yeah. kid. Big, well, again. Muscular kid. So, and I think he's from New York, too. Got a little bit of that in him. Um, but What's so, that supposed to mean? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Nah, doesn't seem like he grew up on the farm, you know, maybe tending to the animals. So the, Seems like he's got a little edge to him. But anyway, um, so he'll walk, you know, on fr- on fr- not on Friday, against Florida on Tuesday. They're already up. It's already after his grand slam, I think. Maybe before. It doesn't matter. But he almost gets hit with the pitch, and he takes three steps to the pitcher. Not as if he's going to rush him, but just kind of walking out to him, and the Florida dugout just starts screaming at him. This might have been – actually, this might have been Thursday. This might have been the Miami game. Just starts – the whole dugout starts screaming at him. It was the Miami game, and then he strikes out. uh, So that happened Thursday, so maybe that's part of the context. He literally took four steps to the mound, not to like he was threatening to run, just like I'm going to walk towards you, and then I'm going to get back in the batter's box. And then on Saturday, he walked and uh, just stared down the pitcher for five seconds, seven seconds, as he took off his stuff and dropped his bat. You know, so that's who he is. I don't know what was said between him and the second baseman during the course of the weekend, but I know when he hit that home run in the eighth inning, as he's rounding first, he's yelling at the second baseman and pointing at him. He's not yelling at the pitcher. He's not yelling at anybody else. He's yelling at the second baseman, who I don't know if he could even hear him because it was so loud in there. But the shortstop sees it. It takes off his glove and walks almost into the base path to confront him. But then just keeps running. He rounds third. He does the shush sign probably three times. Touches home. Puts the U up. Cracks it over his knee. And then goes and celebrates with his teammate. Well, you know, if that if, it, if somebody else was doing that to your team, You'd be like, screw this guy. Look, what is, act like you've hit a home run before, and Dingus has hit a lot, meaning the Miami first baseman had just had enough. And it was Torres, who, by the way, is a really good hitter. He's on the Golden Spikes watch list, and he went 0 for 11 this weekend. So he was already not in a good mood. He sees this and starts barking at Dingus, who doesn't see him because the whole dugout's celebrating. And he's walking almost to the floor. To, and I'm clocking the whole thing because I, I'm always on Marco watch. <laughs> And so I'm clocking the whole thing of how they're responding to him. Everybody else is watching the celebration on plate, and I see the, the the first baseman is getting really upset and agitated, and his coaches see it. So they start coming out on the on the field. The first baseman starts walking towards the dugout. Finally, it gets settled in the Florida State dugout, and they see that this guy's yelling at him, and they start barking at him. Like 20 guys run over to that edge of the dugout and start barking at him, and then he says something that only the first base umpire could hear, but he says something that where the first base umpire immediately ejects him. So that's what happened. And then at the end of the inning, the left fielder, who made great catches all weekend, especially against Cam Smith, he robbed him like three times. I don't. I guess he made the last out. I guess he recorded the last out of the third inning or the eighth inning. I don't remember how it worked. But he ended up throwing the ball, trying throwing the ball into the Florida State dugout as he's running off the field. It almost hits Andrew Armstrong as he's walking to the mound. He didn't see it. So McGuire Holbrook sees it, picks up the ball, starts yelling. Holbrook gets tossed. And then the left fielder gets tossed. And then his spot comes up in the ninth inning, and he's been ejected. But, of course, the kid that pinch hits for him gets a hit and, and keeps the game alive, and they end up almost almost coming back to tie the game. So that's all that happened. It all started with Marco, but I don't know what they were saying to Marco earlier in the series that made Marco want to talk like he did to the second baseman. And Marco, Marco got tossed, right? No, I don't he think so. He didn't get tossed? It's also, I don't think so because I, I – but even if he did, he's the DH, so yeah. I, I, we wouldn't have known. But I thought just Holbrook got tossed and then their first baseman and left fielder got tossed. And after the game, Link said that the coaches agreed not to do a player handshake line, <laughs> which was very smart. Old Corey Clark had his phone ready to go from the press box. We're not allowed to film the actual game. Nobody said anything about handshake lines, and I had my camera ready to go. I hit record, and it was just the coaches shaking hands. They agreed to not have the players shake hands like they normally do at the end of a series, which was very, very smart. It's a dumb thing to do anyway. There's no need to shake hands after competition. You're not nine. You don't have to say good game. 
Um, but uh, that would have been – that could have gotten ugly. There's no way it wasn't going to get ugly. Um, so that was really smart for them because they're testosterone-fueled 21-year-olds. One team is really happy that it, but's pissed off that somebody just threw a ball at their dugout. The other team just got swept. So they're not. It wasn't going to be a lot of hey man, I appreciate the way you play. There wasn't going to be a lot of that. So it was really smart that they kept that from happening. Florida State now thirty and five on the season. Uh, midweeker Tuesday against Mercer. What do you, Aslan? I feel like you would you like this Florida State team, and it's uh it's uh what for? It's tenacity. Makeup. Yeah, it's man. makeup. The way it carries itself. I'm more old school, where some of it can rub me the wrong way, but I'm also an old man. I get it. Um, I feel like they're right up your alley. I like Dinges a lot. He went to East Lake, so he's got he's got North. So he's not from New York. He's from New York, but he went to my high school for like oh, okay. a year or two or something like okay. that. But, right. So he, he's got well, some, that explains it. Yeah, he's, got some, you... he's got some snobbery in him. Although I will say, I'm glad how you pointed out all all the outlandishness that happened and it not gave Miami an out. But if if the tables were turned, we would be not very impressed with uh, their designated hitter if they had done that I don't I don't know I still don't know how I feel about Cam Smith like moonwalking to first base after the two-run home run he hit on Saturday like in the fourth inning or whatever it was buddy they got they got I I honestly think and we'll ask Link after the season or I guess maybe on the way to Omaha yeah like I think Cam Leiter like lit this thing mm. like maybe they had they had a, a meeting as a team anyway and we're like, hey, y'all remember twenty twenty two Tennessee? That's our model. I don't. I don't know. They're not nearly they're that not. obnoxious. No, they're not. They're Nothing not, could they're. ever be that obnoxious. Um, but uh, but it, it's like Cam Leiter that first game against who they Butler Butler yeah. Uh, you know, getting a strikeout in the first inning and just like strutting and and screaming and and getting all fired up. It's like it. It, it, it was a Bunsen burner that was ignited. That's a mm-hmm. thing, right? Yeah, hey, yeah, Bunsen burners. Those are things. Yeah, uh, so uh, bunts and burners are a thing. They are. Absolutely. So, yeah, so it's like it lit that up. And, like, this team just – they're all like it. They all got a little cockiness in them. They all got just a hint of obnoxious in them. But that's college baseball now. It's not like they they stand out. No, no, Every no. team does this. In fact, Link talked about it afterwards, which I thought was funny. He was talking about how – you know, I asked him, like, what did Marco do? Because he, he didn't stare it down. Certainly, like he did the Grand Slam against Florida, and he goes, he goes, I really don't know, and I believed him um, that he really doesn't know what what Marco did, why they were so mad. But he's like, it kind of comes with the territory in college baseball now. It's become so much more about the showmanship than the actual game. Hmm. And you know, obviously, Link lived that firsthand two years ago in Knoxville. He's the he's the reason that team lost. It's awesome. He'll always have a special place in everyone's hearts for beating that Tennessee team in Knoxville. But he's seen it up close and personal. And I just think that's what college baseball is now. Like, um, So, with that in mind, Florida State fits in with everybody else, except they're also really, really good. More like obnoxiousville. Mm. Well said. Hey-o. Well said. Real quick on that, though. Not that in any way Link condone. I don't want to say he doesn't condone it, but I don't, I don't think Link – is trying to harvest it. But I think Link's confidence and the way he carries himself, I think gives them the level of confidence to have their kind of bravado. Just like the way he just marches out to the to the mound to be like, all right, Andrew, like you don't have it tonight, man. Give me the ball. Thank you, man. Next guy up. You know, yeah. just the fact that he is so focused and driven on on winning games and will do everything he possibly can, push all the right buttons. I wonder if they just see the way that that Link carries himself, like the his confidence. And then that gives them the confidence to think that, you know, I mean, we've got a coach that's putting us in the in the best positions possible. We're surrounded by all sorts of talent, whether we're in the field or whether we're at the plate or if we're in the bullpen. I, I just I think there's I think again, I don't think he's telling these guys, like, oh, yeah, go out there. Tell them like let them know who you are. Show them yeah. the name on the back of your jersey. But I think there's a level of, of confidence and uh the the way that Link carries himself that gives you a level of of confidence as well that makes you want to go out there and, and, and play your best and, and not be afraid to show why it is that you're so good. So Yeah, I, I talked to a, a player's parent who talked about Link and said that uh, they are incredibly well prepared for every game they play, for every series they play. Um, and you, you can see that, man. That guy doesn't seem like somebody that just, oh, it's 5 o'clock, got to go. Right. Got got dinner plans. Like, he, he lives this stuff. This This means more to him than anything. He is – 
just in it. He just lives it. He's immersed in it. Um, and yeah, he's a no nonsense guy. But I think yeah, if you play for somebody like that, you're like man, because I you know it must be really fun. And I I don't have a great experience with with. Uh, with organized sports in that I played high school baseball. That's it. That was the extent of it. And my coach was an idiot. No offense to my coach, but he was an idiot. He didn't know what he was doing. And it must be certainly in hindsight. I didn't know that at the time, right. but in hindsight, I absolutely, he was, a, he was an idiot uh, as a baseball coach, not as a human being. He just he wasn't a very smart baseball coach. He didn't bat but Corey I, cleanup. I mean, what kind of he didn't bat me lead off, buddy, I get on base. That's what I do. I'm a glove, but I can get on base, and he didn't even play me. Flipping idiot! Unbelievable. No, but so, but it must be. But the point is, I quit baseball my senior year just because I, I, I knew I probably wasn't going to play much. Which I'm not saying he was an idiot for that. But the way he ran that program, there was no, there was no like real respect or pride in playing at that program. And we were a pretty good team up in the uh, Atlanta area, but there was no real pride there. Not like there was at Parkview for all my Gwinnett County listeners back mm. then. Um, it must, so I, just putting myself in that position, it must be awesome. Even if you don't like your role on the team necessarily, um, or you had a bad weekend or whatever, or, or Link rubs you the wrong way. I don't know what their relationships are with that guy. But it must be so refreshing and to know that you're playing, to respect your coach because you know he's really good at his job. You know what I mean? Like what? 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 You talk about confidence. What confidence that must give you that this guy that we're playing for is really good at his job. Just like going to the other field, Florida State football players must feel mm-hmm. like I know. I know this guy knows what he's talking about. He's really, really good. And the pride and res- the pride that comes with that, and the confidence that comes from knowing that you you're not going to win every game. And you're not you're going to make mistakes, and he's going to make mistakes. But by and large, you are going to be better prepared than every other dugout you play against, or every other sideline you go against. You're going to be better prepared because you've got the better coach. That's got to be a really uh, a really cool feeling as an athlete. Well said, Corey. Thanks, buddy. On the way out, transfer portal opens either today or tomorrow. I don't know. I feel like it's supposed to open on Tuesday, but people have the said sixteenth. Maybe That's Tuesday. That is okay. Tuesday. Yeah, I think it's the sixteenth. Over under three and a half players announce they're transferring out of Florida State this week, or do you think? Oh, be- I think it'll. Be, I think that'll be under. Okay. I think the actual number will be over, but I think it'll be after the spring game. Okay. Most of them. Right. And I'm not counting greedy either. Oh, um, all right. Because he's definitely seen. under. Okay. If you want to know what's happening in the portal, go to WordChant.com. On three network, we're leveraged everywhere, all teams. All different facets, NIL game, recruiting game. So the relationships are there. We've got all the information. Again, FSU won. Two months, $1. Do it. Jeff Cameron Show, 1 to 3 o'clock. We'll be back maybe tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see, buddy. Yeah. I like that. He's Corey Maslon. Thanks for listening to Wake Up Board Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.